but you're from here, from the state, so I'm sorry we'll have to I would. John, I'm co-hosting with uh, Howard. How's it, Etienne? Uh, hi, nice to meet you, Herschel. Okay, I'll, I'll be on mute.
Hi. How's it, Jason? How's it? How are you? Good. Who's that? Herschel, it's, how's it? Yeah, how's it? Second, second week in a row. Nice to have you for the for the double. Isn't that isn't that great? What a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, good evening, everyone. The time is quarter to seven in a rather chilly Johannesburg. And we're touching base with people all over the world. We're, of course, going to go live officially at 7 p.m. South Africa time. So we've got about 15 minutes to go before we began, begin. And that gives us an opportunity to chat to everyone around here and everyone involved. So in a second, Danny Cato is going to stop the screens from flashing around us over there. And we're going to be talking to all of our guests. So Herschel Javits, you were talking about how do you stop reflections into your glasses? How yeah, I went online and it said you, you've got you've got to raise the light above eye level. So at at six foot two and a half, it's it's posing a challenge. So I, I have my lamp on a table on a chair in front of me. Um, not sure if it's helping, but it, it is what it is. We've got a fantastic uh, evening ahead of us. I hope my glare is not distracting from the event. Well, you saying six foot two and a half, Saul Simon. My sense is just looking at you and knowing your brother and having seen footage of the rest of your family. My sense is that you're taller than than maybe six foot two and a half. Let's just get you unmuted. My answer was I wish. Really? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm six one, but it's okay. I'm on my way. I'm still growing. <laughs> well, well, let's take touch base with everyone around the world. And Etienne, where do you join us from? I'm in I'm in Johannesburg. Okay, I've heard of that place. Do you have internet? Because there's a massive internet <laughs> outage in parts of Johannesburg on Vumatel today. <laughs> it comes and goes, and it comes and goes with load shedding. But uh, at the moment, we are rocking it, and we're good. <laughs> so, so for those people who are not in uh, South <laughs> Africa. And I, I think Sharit, Sharit is, is busy talking to people. She's shouting at her kids. She's shouting at her kids. Oh, they probably deserve it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no. First, first of all, we can't hear your audio. That's the most important thing. And your, your lighting is very bright. And Kojo is greeting us from Georgetown in Guyana. Know, okay, and, and Sharit, if you're talking to other people, you have to go on mute because you have hundreds and hundreds of people watching you already. And uh, that means we hope you've got your clothes on and we hope you're behaving yourself. But Joey Pearl, you look like you're sitting in the dark. I, I can't even see if you're there. Tony, can you hear us? Yeah. We've got load shedding at the moment, and all I can get working is my laptop. I've got no lights working. Have you got a candle or two you can put around uh, where you are? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> let's pretend it's Shabbos. In fact, let's pretend it's Hanukkah and get eight candles around you. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Etan, you are in Johannesburg. So where are you joining us from? Israel. Okay, we've heard about that, but you spent a big chunk of the week on aeroplanes? Yes. <laughs> okay, it happens. Joey Blau, let's touch base with you. How are you? Well, thanks. Yourself? Fantastic. So where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from a load shedding Johannesburg, so excuse the noise of the generator in the background. Um, and I had a similar problem to Herschel, except the glare was coming off my bald head, not my glasses. <laughs> Load shedding okay, helped that problem. <laughs> we, we are, however, going to ask you to stop shuffling when you talk to us because you're making us seasick. <laughs> okay, no problem. Harold, it looks like you have lights. Uh, we got lights. It's a miracle. Absolutely. So you know what we say in Johannesburg? I beg your internet. Pardon? What we say in Johannesburg? Internet electricity, and water. Select one of the three, but you can't have all three at the same time. Exactly. Jason Hoff, two weeks in a row, Herschel was saying. 
Absolutely. What a what a privilege. What a blessing. Thanks again. You're Howard. also shochling. Don't become religious. Every time you move backwards and forwards, <laughs> everyone else watching you starts I'm, getting nauseous. Okay. So stay, stay, stay still. Stay still. I'm staying, I'm staying dead still. Cool. So again, thank you. A privilege and a blessing. Thanks again. You know, we had we made this film, me and Etienne, and our dear late friend Mark, who shot it, who's in heaven about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And, you know, we, obviously this has just rejuvenated everything and and br brought back all the memories. And of course, chatting to every, seeing all these people online and watching the movie again a couple of times this week to get the right version together, brought back a, a flood of great memories and, a, and lingering good feelings for what actually happened after the film and with my, uh, the relationships I built with people afterwards, which I could talk about later on when we have a have a big audience so thanks again howard really terrific effort thank you so so tell me jay did you speak to any of the people the parents of some of the people on on the show in the movie that we're going to see tonight did i speak to them did recently? you ever or ever did? ever meet for the movie do they feature in the movie okay well of course smokey simon of course um but i saw the name katsu who who was who featured uh, where's, he, he featured <laughs> Uh, when we did our talk at this at the Great Park as well, when this was all developing, and I think him and uh, Sharit actually spoke initially because he was involved in the book that motivated a, a lot of the research. So he was, I think, instrumental. I hope he's he's getting the kudos he deserves. He was definitely instrumental in this. And of course, going back to Sharit, who's here on this call, I hope still on the call. Well, this was all her brainchild. And uh, she was a producer and an exec producer throughout this, this process and, and really brought it to us. So we were really lucky that someone did an intro at the time and then it all came together. So, um, so yeah, but I'm seeing who else am I seeing here on, on the call that I... Um, so did you have any blouse in? Did you have any of the maggots in? Maggots, of course, but maggots... Um, wait, what was the first name of the of the Machalnik? So which maggot have we got? Eddie, in the, Ed, Eddie the, the famous Eddie, mayor, the mayor of, mayor of, the of, mayor. of Johannesburg. He wasn't in the movie, if you can believe that, yeah. Um, but he was, of course... But he's still alive and well. Harold Howell, is Eddie today? Yeah, he's good. 95, I went in 96. Uh, yeah, managing, not easily, but managing. Okay, and now Rodney, is it your dad who wrote the book? Uh, no, no, not my dad. Um, I'm not sure what book you're referring to. There's a, I mean, there's a book brother, called Henry Eight... Katsu, I think, wrote the book. Is that no yeah. relation? Henry Katsu it was my dad's older brother by 10 years, my uncle. Okay, um, and, well, and that book is called 800. South Africa's 800. Yes, uh, South Africans 800, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, introduce us to who has just come to sit next to you that we can't see. Okay, so uh, that's my brother, Steve. So you have Steve and me on today, and, and I believe my sister will be also uh, online with uh, this evening. So all three of us yeah, will be here for my dad, Joe Katsu. The name has been mentioned. We feel very privileged and to, 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 to have this opportunity to share what we, we remember of him and, and really in, in his blessed memory. And, and in fact, there are lots of descendants because there were 804 people who went. And from, from then, that's probably given us close to 2,000 descendants of those people. So our apologies to those people who are not on this evening. But uh, it's definitely going to be a really interesting uh, evening. I see we just lost Sarit. Maybe load shedding has come back or internet has disappeared. Yeah, shame. She just actually WhatsApp me saying load shedding and no Wi-Fi. So I'm going to just tell her to please try again, obviously, because it's it would be uh, very nice to hear her initial thoughts and as to how this all began in 2010. Etienne, was it 2010? 2010, I think. I, I, I think we did our first exploratory interview to even much before then. I think we did our first interview in kind of 2006, 2007. And then we started oh, shooting the know. documentary in earnest uh, the, just before the World Cup over here, yeah. So sure. just to do some very quick housekeeping, Joey, I see you logged on twice. Can I boot the one that I can't see video on off the screen? Yeah, I think you can. I'm also having internet issues. So okay, I, so boot the I, one I'm off. booting that that one off. And I uh, and Judith Katsu shouldn't be on this link either. So Rod, I'm booting your wife off. She needs to register and go back on a normal link because okay. she's used the link that I've sent you. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
it, my my link has got the correct name because I'm I'm, I'm your, we, we just want to your make link sure has the, got the correct name, but Judith should be on the standard normal link yeah. unless she plans on coming to talk about members. No, of no, no, we were just playing around trying to see what computer to use and what was the best. Okay, she's she's already booted off. Sharit, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> Can you it's, hear me um, better now? We can we can hear you. We can even see you. Everyone's jumping around on the screen at the mm -hmm. moment, but don't worry, we're going to swap as soon as we go live to a single view. So I want to talk in, in a few minutes uh, about putting mm -hmm. this movie together. And everyone says it was Sharit's mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, Rodney, when we're talking, no one else is talking. You go on mute if you need to talk to someone, please. Uh, sorry Sharit? About that. That it was your idea. Tell us where this came from. So, like this untold story about heroes, when you meet these old men and you kind of think, what were they? And I think that was the that's the incredible story that they they were youngsters and they were our absolute heroes, the unsung heroes of our community that no one knew their no one knew their story. And when between Jason and Etienne and I we made our mission to for people to know their story so and to i want i want to correct the heroism and the act of bravery i want to correct something that you said because these you said these young men but in fact there were young men and many women as well mm -hmm. and one of the points that we made last week is Absolutely. in fact in fact uh, i mean so we're going to be talking about your mother who is a mahalnik correct and we spoke last week about many female doctors and nurses that went. This wasn't just a boys' game. And war is not a game. I mean, these people went no. through often, often hell. So what was your connection? What was the spark? Why did the story come to you? And why was it important for you to tell? So I'm actually We've... not even certain how I first came across the story of the war. Um, but when I came across it, it was it was a story. I mean, I I know none of my friends knew about the eight hundred and four, um, and it was just a mission. Then we needed the story needed to be told. And so, and as you say about the men, and the, yeah. And and so you went to go find Jason. Jason, were you second stop on the journey? I think I was. Uh, I think we were. As a production company, the the, the first stop, uh, Sharit successfully raised some money to to put a promo together, which Etienne and I did. Etienne uh, directed and and uh, cut it, and then we used that promo then to to open it up to sponsors. And in a in a very short space of time, albeit a few years later, the generosity of the of the South African Jews came through, you know, as as it always does. And uh, you know, obviously to to name drop. <laughs> The Michelles helped us. The Kirsch family, Diskem was great, and then a, a whole a whole bunch of other people as well. And once we once we'd got the, the you know the bulk of it going, then we said, right, let's let's get cracking. And then there was this enormous response from everybody. And you know, just just to tell you a quick funny story aside, when we were in uh, I, I, Etienne had given me the wrong solution to put into my eye because I had something stuck in my eye. Anyway, burnt <laughs> the back of my eyeballs nearly out, and we had to go to a chemist in. Uh, in I think it was Hertzlia Petuach where we were going to interview Smokey and uh, Migdal Tepperson. And this lady ran out of the chemist saying, are you making a movie about the Machal? And, uh, verbatim. And we said, yes, absolutely. Well, then you have to come and meet my husband. And she was talking about Ruben Naronsky, the pilot who's in the show, who's, who was a tr tremendous story as well. He became an allied pilot for many, many years afterwards. And uh, and there was it. So we said, right, well, after we finish this interview, we're going to just shoot across to the to the house down the road. And a lot of this kind of organic process happened. But people were so willing and so helpful throughout the you know the whole process that uh, that's how we got. I think we shot 42, 40 or forty two interviews overall. So we we really got as many people as we could. So yeah, it's more. Etienne, style. what? Just, sorry, just sorry. Add on that on on that point of of Migdal Tepperson, who, who happens to be a, a a relative of ours, but. He eventually attained the rank of colonel in, in the Israeli army, and he retired a, a number of years ago. He's since passed, but he retired as, as the, at the age of 70 as the oldest reservist then in the history of the, the Israeli army. At the age of 70, he finally retired as a, as a reservist. Hmm. 
quite that's, remarkable. That, that's absolutely incredible. But I want to ask Etienne, like, to make a movie and to make a documentary is often a passion project. So tell us what it was like. It's almost you came from outside our community to tell a story about our community. What was that like? Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, you know, I think part of it was about archiving these people's stories and meeting everybody and hearing what they had to say and this incredible experience that they lived through. And putting the story together was quite unusual for a documentary because, you know, usually in a documentary, you have um, kind of two or three main voices. And this was a completely different kind of a thing where, as Jason said, we interviewed about 42 different people and we wanted to incorporate all of them into the story that we told. And that was quite unique about putting this thing together um, from the point of view of interviewing them and scripting it and cutting the whole thing together is how do you put a documentary together in kind of a little less than an hour where you're featuring so many different voices and so many different stories? Um, it, and, and it was incredible that that we could hear all of their stories and piece it together in a way that made sense as a single narrative. So I see Arthur is saying, hi, or all, all, it's Arthur, first cousin of Saul Simon and Smokey Simon's nephew. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so nice to see, Saul, that the family's watching from around the world. But yeah. Etienne, I want to know, having interviewed all of these people, is there a common thread? Is there something when you look at, you know, to make a decision to go to war when you don't have to is an amazing thing. Was there a passion? Was there something that you found unified them all together? No, that's a very difficult question because they're all such individuals. Um, one of the people actually said in an interview, if you ask um, two Jewish people a question, you'll get three different opinions. <laughs> and <laughs> that was uh, kind of what we felt with the documentary as well. You know, uh, at the, uh, I get what you're saying as a question, but I think what they all understood at the end is that they were doing it because they wanted to and because they and because they believed in what they were fighting for. Um, and other than that, no, I don't think that there was a single unifying thing. They're all such different individuals. So the amazing thing, people are watching us from all over the world, and I see Ralph Judah just said, hi from Los Angeles. Dorf Judah is my dad, head of air operations in 1948. And Ralph, I tried to track you down. I, uh, if you look for yourself on the internet, you see that it says resigned from Deloitte, but there was no other way to track you down. Of course, you may remember that I did my articles for your father. He introduced me to the story of what happened in 1948 and particularly the Air Force. Saul, I don't know if you ever met the Judas, but Ralph, I wanted you desperately to come on uh, and may and maybe we can promote you a little later onto, onto the show. I'd love to tell some stories about your dad, one of the most colorful, amazing human beings that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, you may recall we once uh, spoke when I was at the IEC and you were doing consulting in South Africa, um, but that we, we haven't actually met at all. That having been said, there are people watching us from around the world. We'd love to know where you're watching us from. Please drop us a note in the comment section, whether you're watching us on Facebook, on Zoom, or alternatively on YouTube. Just put a comment in. Let us know where you're watching from. But more importantly, tell us if you have a connection to the story, the story of any of the 804 South Africans who dropped everything to go fight for Israel's independence in 1948. With that, I'm going to ask everyone except Herschel and myself to turn off their cameras and go on mute. And we're going to talk about the first ever South African Jewish Report online film festival. So, Etienne, I trust you're a techie. I can uh, trust you to turn off your camera and go on mute there. Hirsch, we did the story last week. Sarit, please mute yourself and turn off your camera. Otherwise, I'll do that from here. Hirsch, we, last week we had Nancy Spielberg on. We told one version of the story almost an American version of, of the story. And the response was overwhelming. I know this is a story you're very, very passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. How I mean, just uh, just an absolutely remarkable story. And if, and if you think about the South African Jewish community, those who have remained in South Africa and those who have spread their wings across the globe, whether it be in the sciences or business or education or in the field of medicines, the South African community has always boxed above its weight and its impact on the on the world in, at, a, at a global level ha, has been phenomenal, and you almost think that watching 
last week's documentary above and beyond and what we're going to see today is, is where it all started just ordinary people making a enormous impact on on israel and on the future of of, of the jewish people and and, it, and it's you know it sounds almost over dramatic but it, it isn't it, it was just remarkable last week um i think this week is going to be completely different uh, it's a uniquely south african perspective and, and we have the, the next generation of these heroes who went to fight for the independence of Israel to tell us their stories as, as the, the next generation. And we've got in the coming weeks um, just some more remarkable shows about a uh, famous South African Mossad spy, one of the most famous. So you will see that all last week, and I'm sure in the week to come, people were contacting us and saying, oh, my father fought in the Machal. Oh, I've got an uncle who is there. I, I see the people who've just posted now about members of their family who fought during Israel's war of independence and dropped everything and went, went to go volunteer. And one of the common things that we hear from so many people is people didn't tell their parents. They told their parents they were going on holiday to Europe and they kind of snuck across in order in order to participate in the war of independence. It's amazing. Like you don't say things about your children and your grandchildren because they just repeat the exact same things that maybe their grandparents did as well. So it's an amazing week. And uh, we're so delighted to be able to bring the story to everyone watching us tonight around the globe. And this is the 153rd broadcast, I think, that we've done uh, since COVID began on behalf of the South African Jewish Report. I want to welcome you all this evening, and I want to check that you've seen the latest edition of the Jewish Report newspaper. Danny, I know we can get these copies of the newspaper in so many places at Spa and Checkers and Pick and Pay and at uh, your local garage shop, and we flip screen so I can't show people what's on the front page of the newspaper this week. We need to go in the opposite direction. There, it's about BRICS and terrorism and an attempt by BRICS to counter terrorism. It's our lead story, but there are a lot of amazing stories. And the story of Nancy Spielberg is very much on, I think, page three of the newspaper. Go pick up a copy. And if you can't get a hard copy, don't forget, you can also read us online at sajr.co.za. You can either go download the entire edition or alternatively, go look at each of the individual stories themselves. So we get about 74,000 unique people who go onto our website every week to go look at the newspaper. We also have about 34,000 people who get our webinars, or uh, sorry, who get our newsletter. And alternatively, or in addition to all of that, we distribute to about 33,000 people every week. So we cover everyone everywhere. And we've really become an international publication. And we're so grateful to our editor and staff at the Jewish Report for being able to tell amazing, remarkable stories with no cover ups, no hiding things under the carpet, but really pure proper journalism that tells the amazing story about our community. All of our webinars are online. You can go and watch them. You can go either onto the Jewish Report website and just click on webinars or on YouTube. You can go to look for the SA Jewish Report and you'll find almost all of them. Last week's webinar, unfortunately, with Nancy Spielberg is no longer up. They're copyright issues, and she did not understand the reach that we had around the world. So we had to take it down after one day. So unfortunately, you won't be able to watch Above and Beyond, which we showed last week. But you will be able for at least the next week to be able to see tonight's webinar and the movie we're going to show online. And that's really important, Herschel, because once again, we have outages in Johannesburg. We have electrical outages, and we've got a big internet outage in Johannesburg as well. You look like you have lights tonight. Yeah, we're we're lit, and um, I'm I guess lucky to have some sort of backup power supply. So um, we, we're we're set and, and and ready to go. So you talk about your backup and power supply, and while we're showing the movies over the next few weeks, we're showing Sylvia tracing blood. We show getting away with murders. We're showing we're showing many of these remarkable movies, but there are people who don't have a backup. People, when the lights go out, are sitting in the cold and sitting in the dark, and they've got no way to keep warm, and they have no way to, in fact, be lit during the period. So we started last week, and we're going to do that again tonight. We've decided that while people are sitting in the comfort of their homes with their heaters on, with the lights on, we need to recognize that they're members of our own community and the broader community who don't have access to that. 
So last week we said, if you're sitting at home and if you can afford it, please give a donation and we're going to take the money you donate and we're going to provide battery operated lights, rechargeable lights to people in our community and in the townships who have no lights when their electricity goes off. And we're going to give people hot water bottles so they can fill them up before their electricity goes off as well and have some warmth. And you know what the amazing thing was, Hirsch? In one single week, in one showing last week, we managed to provide lights and hot water bottles to more than 500 people in a single, single showing. It was absolutely astounding. So we've worked together with the Jewish Women's Benevolent Society. They are distributing lights throughout Sandringham Gardens, throughout Selwyn Siegel, to people within the care of the Hevra condition. They're taking a chunk of lights. We also have a group that are go, going to Yadaron. They distributing to all the people that they give food parcels to. The Angel Network is distribution distributing to the townships in Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Durban. And over the next week, because we're going to raise some more money, money tonight, we're going to make sure that members of the Jewish community in Johannesburg and Durban as well, who may be sitting in the dark tonight or are cold because they don't have electricity, will be able to access this as well. So... Tonight, we're going to ask you that if you are able to, please, we beg you, make a donation. All of the money that is collected goes towards charity. We're showing 804 and these amazing documentaries tonight. We've teamed up with the Angel Network. And if you can, we'd love you to make a donation. On your screen at the moment, you'll see that we've got the bank account details, a snap scan, a wallet doc. We're going to show you that. If you have your camera with you, just take it, point it at the screen, take a picture, particularly if on Facebook or YouTube and you're watching, take a picture of the bank account details and just do a transfer to the Angel Network to be able to buy lights and, um, and hot water bottles. 250 Rand will get a family actually operational. So it's not a lot of money if you can afford it. Please either transfer to the Angel Network or take your camera off your phone, point it at the snap scan that's on the screen now, and it will open up a website and you'll be able to make a donation for people who are much less fortunate than yourself. In addition to that, for those people who are watching tonight on Zoom, we can in fact ask you to make a pledge. And if you just click on the poll that's coming up right now that says, I'd like to support the Angel Network and donate lights this winter, please say yes or yes indeed. And we'll send you an email and you'll be able to make a donation and make sure that people sitting in the dark and in the cold have access to amazing facilities. So yesterday, last week, about 280 people donated already. I see tonight that we already like 60, 70 people have already agreed to make a donation tonight, but we can really make an unbelievable difference in people's lives just by giving a little light this winter. And I think that's one of the things that is most inspiring. When you think about all of the work that the Jewish Report has done and Herschel and myself are volunteers in all of this process, the time people have given up and the money that we've raised for causes throughout the period of COVID, it's just one of the most remarkable, inspiring stories of our community. So we are enormously appreciative of that. If you want to use your credit card, we've put the wallet doc information on screen as well. And I see I'm busy counting another 120, 130 people have already undertaken to make donations. And we will make sure not only that every single cent raised goes towards helping those who are less privileged in our community and the general community, but you'll also be entitled to a Section 18A tax certificate as well. So thank you to everyone who has agreed to make a donation this evening. Your money will be well used, and we are so, so appreciative of everything that, that you guys do. Hirsch, with that, what do you want to tell us before we turn off the comment section because we're going to turn off the comment section so people's movie watching isn't disturbed, but we'll open up uh, open it up again as soon as soon as the movie's been shown. Hirsch, this is a topic very, very close to your heart. No, Howie, I think it's close to everyone's heart. And just looking at the 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 chat, um, there's uh, there's a comment from Richard Friedland, who we all know and who is kept us up to date over the years about what's happening with COVID. Uh, you know, his, his, uh, his late father was a guy named one of Israel's first tanks in, in, in 48. In fact, if you look in the, in the book of the 800, there, there are pictures of, 
of of him. My uncle is messaging me from from uh, Florida and the US to say they hosted Ezra Weitzman when they were training in then Rhodesia for a Shabbos dinner, uh, as the community did. So I, I think you know uh, there's not a direct connection for for me, but if you just look at the comments, uh, the, the 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 connection spreads far and wide from from South Africa into the into the diaspora. And, and it's it's part of the, the remarkable story and the, and the beginnings of the state of Israel um, and, and the home of the Jewish people. And I, I think that the documentary that's coming up is is going to be a, a an amazing uh, follow on to what we what we watched last week about those amazing pilots uh, forming the, the basis for the Israeli Air Force. So, Hirsch, you and I are going to turn off our cameras and our microphones. We're going to watch the documentary. We'll be back in about an hour and we're going to be talking to about six kids of Machalniks and hopefully some more as well. And they're going to be telling us very personal stories about their parents and their parents' ex experience in the 1948 war. So we'll see you back again in about an hour as we begin the movie. volunteers from abroad. These volunteers rallied from far and wide to Israel's defense the men and when the nation Jewish state served was in distinction in all branches of the fledgling Israel Defense Forces. Air Force, Artillery, Infantry, Medical Corps, Navy, Signals, generally without Tank rank Corps, or recognition, and made an invaluable contribution towards winning the war to and laying the foundations military of training, IDF. expertise, and experience were of crucial importance to the successful outcome of the War of Independence. Most of the volunteers returned to their home countries after the war, but a significant number stayed on and others came back. Homeland for the Jewish people was a dream 2,000 years in the making. The Jewish homeland had been a long time in preparation. The Balfour Declaration and the League of Nations in 1922 established that there should be not only a Jewish homeland in Palestine, but once there was a Jewish majority, there should be a Jewish state. This had been the lifelong dream center of the Jewish experience and that's what the Zionist movement had been striving for for so long. South Africa had always been sympathetic to Zionism. South African Zionism has its roots in Lithuania, which of course is the seedbed of South African Jewry. The idea of Israel then was something that had a lot of sympathy in South Africa. South Africa was really a, a Zionistic community. By 1905, South Africa had a South African Zionist Federation. Many, many of us belong to different Zionist movements here. The environment, and I'm thinking of the white polity, was very useful for Zionism insofar as Jews had no assimilatory pressures. They could find a position between the Afrikaans speakers, the English speakers. There was no real sense of South Africanism in the first half of the 20th century and they had a place there which was accepted. This current of wanting to help the Jewish state, this new fledgling Jewish state, went through like a, a wildfire. For, for us dedicated Zionists, we regarded ourselves already before we came to Israel as future citizens of the Jewish state. 
It was a time of momentous change. It was the month in which the State of Israel was officially declared. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority, new State of Israel. The United Nations took their decision on the 29th of, of uh, November, 1947. And there, there we have this amazing current. It was like an electric current that went through the people. Well, it, it was fantastic news. We were dancing in Dissingoff Square. The whole place was packed chock-a-block and we were dancing and singing all through the night. But from that very day, there was resistance to the notion of a Jewish state. When we reached the outskirts of Tel Aviv, we passed three British armoured cars with uh, people standing in them, looking out of the, uh, out, out of the top. And as we passed them, everybody started singing. And one British officer with his face absolutely contorted with hate, pulled out his pistol and fired at the bus. The world was very sympathetic to the Jews until they saw that the Jews could fight. And when they saw the Jews can fight, they started being sympathetic to the Arabs. And the day following the declaration of the state, war broke out on literally every side. There was Egypt, and Jordan, and Syria, and Lebanon, and Iraq, and Kaukjiz, which was uh, uh, a gang of, uh, of Arab militants from the Galilee. You know, you, you can't count the numbers. What were we? Uh, we weren't even a million. What were we? Six, six hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand again? Millions? The recent persecution of Jews in Europe in World War II was an additional motivator for volunteers to heed Israel's call. I felt that we got to have our own country and things like that happened in Germany, it shouldn't happen again. Six million Jews went to the, were sacrificed. It amplified for us the need for a homeland. We were aware of the, 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 the concentration camps and everything else, because our own family was involved. My dad had a habit, even if it was, he had a business, a general dealer in Tunison, and he had a habit, Rosh Hashanah or not, Two days Rosh Hashanah, he had to go to the post to clear the mail, the post box. So off he goes in the middle of the service and he comes back with a letter from Europe. Now, most of the people in that congregation were immigrants, all of them. Virtually all of them had family still in Europe. And that letter was the first letter that anyone had received. It created a hell of an impact in the shul. It almost stopped the service. So that's part of the background. Then there was a deportation by the British of Holocaust survivors uh, because you know there was a white paper at the time which allowed 100,000 immigrants to Israel and the British turned these ships with Holocaust survivors back and sent them to Cyprus and Madagascar and Mauritius uh, all over the world. Volunteers came from all over the world America, Canada, Great Britain, Latin America France and Belgium, as well as small contingents from elsewhere. And of course, from South Africa. Official count, including uh, kibbutz members, who were mostly on frontline kibbutz members, was 832. Per capita, South Africa, of course, was the top. Even, although there were more from America, but, uh, but we, we were such a small Jewish community by comparison. reasons for volunteering to fight were varied. 
Some were ardent Zionists, others were driven by religion. Some felt a simple duty to fight for a Jewish homeland. Some felt compelled to offer their combat expertise. Others were driven by more emotional reasons. I was very emotionally uh, affected by the story of the exodus of the refugees from the refugee camps, people who had been through the Shoah, who got on these desperate boats to come to Palestine as it then was, and were turned back by the British. I've never been a religious bloke and I've never been a Zionist bloke, but I just felt I wanted to, I had, I had to go do my bit for Israel. We just wanted to get there and do something to help the country. I felt very relieved to leave South Africa because I was very unhappy with the situation here. And the government had just changed. Remember that May the 14th was when the nationalists came into power. And then there was a question of a Jewish unity. And they realized that the chips were really down. It was a privilege for me to be taking part in something that we had waited for for 2,000 years. There was also a large contingent of non-Jewish volunteers. As a non-Jew, what motivated you? And how did your family feel about it? You've been in World War II, you had risked your neck, you survived the war, and here you come to fight in a war which really isn't your problem. Some went for money, and some went as adventurers. Well, a lot of them were idealistic, believing that it's time after what they heard about the Holocaust, that it was time that the Jews had a place. I just felt that uh, there was a, so much more to be said for what was going on than the world understood. Most of the volunteers had combat experience from the Second World War. Approximately 5% of the South African Jewish population had volunteered in World War II, and that experience was invaluable. For as many South African volunteers that went to Israel in 1948, there are almost as many stories about how they got there. But each person's journey was long, dangerous, and had to be made in secret. We got here in four days. One night, and I don't remember exactly, the first night was in Dola, the second night was, I think, in Kampala, the third in Khartoum, and the fourth we arrived. We landed in Italy, stopped along the way in, in Kenya, Uganda, in, in uh, Sudan. We had to act as uh, just tourists. We didn't know, each we were supposed not to know each other. And they asked me, what, what's your religion? So I said, Dutch Reformed Church. I said, what, what, what say you? <laughs> I spoke to an Afrikaans, and Dutch Reformed. So the English said, can't you see he's too big to be Jewish? So this way I went through as a goy. We couldn't come directly to Israel. We went to Italy first, and we had to join up with a refugee camp. And it was in this camp that we saw the remnants of the Jewish population and we saw the tattoo marks on their arms for the first time and we heard their stories and it was terrifying. Encountering these survivors of the Shoah brought the reality of Jewish persecution into brutal focus and further entrenched the urgent need for a homeland. I was hearing it first hand. I wasn't getting stuff from uh, uh, second or third hand, I heard their actual experiences. They were still so traumatized in that even if there were, the, the, there was plenty of food, they would steal, still steal food, bread and so on and go and hide it. As the boat came in, the lights of the Carmel went on and all these new immigrants from Nazi Europe started to sing Hatikva.
that these Holocaust survivors were sent straight from the concentration camps of Europe into combat is an indication of just how desperate Israel was for help. One of the chaps who just passed away recently, he used to live here, he took part in the Battle of Jerusalem, straight off uh, an immigrant ship, having suffered the Holocaust. They sent a contingent of these Holocaust survivors into, and that was a disaster. They arrived in a land foreign to them, a land already in the firm grip of war. The first four days, uh, I must confess that all our training didn't prepare us for the real thing. They took us off the boat and I went straight into the army. I went to Kiryat Meir and that same morning I was put in the army and that same evening I was sent to the central front. And if you know what it was like then, it was sheer bloody hell. We uh, changed from boys to men in a matter of one or two hours. And uh, I fell into a chat with a British major. Now, we came ostensibly as tourists, so he said, what the hell are you guys doing here now? I said, oh, we're just passing through on the tour. He said, you're crazy, and he pointed down at Haifa and he said, that's where the Arabs have all slaughtered the bloody Jews. And he said, we're leaving, but it won't be three months before they beg on their knees for us to come back and save them. The Makhalniks integrated themselves into every division of the army and their contribution was invaluable. There were doctors and artillery people and naval people and um, all along the spectrum of people who had fought in the, the war who said, we know, we know what, how to fight. The Machal volunteers came from all parts of the world, each with different military training backgrounds. The country for which they were fighting had barely been born, had barely had time to organize itself. The Machalniks fell in with an army in disarray. The Machal were coming in from all over the world, volunteers, and they didn't know how to cope, which units to put us into. This thing had come into being overnight, as it were. So where do you form a structure overnight? The impression of the South African army that I carried forward in a comparison to the Israeli army was a hell of a difference. There was no like chain of command. Things just appeared and disappeared. And it, was, it was like a, a wild west comedy. Of course, that was the army. It wasn't, you know, drilling and saluting and uh, spick and span uniform. Well, you had, like an American would come there and say he was in the Pacific War and he knows about this, that and the other and so they made him a sergeant and we found out he knows nothing. So whoever was doing things, it was wonderful that they did it at all, never mind well or, or not well. Everything still pulled together, at time of need, everything pulled together. Prior to 1948, there was no united Israeli army. Palmach, Irgun and Lehi were distinct entities with varying political ideologies, each fighting for the same cause, but not consolidated into one unified force. They hadn't been formed into a complete army yet. I think when there were three distinct Irgun, Haganah and the Stern group acting independently, it must have been extremely chaotic. The Palmach formed the core of the armed forces when Palestine was under British mandate. They were the elite fighters of the Haganah and had close ties with the land. The Palmach was the cream of the army. They were mainly chaps from the kibbutzes. We didn't, we didn't have army bullshit. We had Palmach bullshit. There was no insignias. There was no officer that were, threw his weight around. You knew he was the officer. You knew in the jeep, you knew that, the, that the, there was a driver, there was a fella next to him, he was in charge of the jeep. Uh, and you knew he, he, he told you what to do and you did it. The moment you got off the jeep, then you were equal. The Irgun 
or Etzel, a right-wing offshoot of the Haganah, was still operating separately from the Palmach when the War of Independence broke out. It had a unit which had, in the meantime, before we arrived and before, when they were still separate units, it had conquered Jaffa. It had experienced it. It had been down to Lydda. It had been in actions at the Etzion block, which was one of the first battles even before the declaration of the state in 47. They were so experienced that they decided they would stay as an Etzel company. Things came to a head between these factions with the Altalena incident. When the Altalena, an Irgun ship carrying weapons, arrived from France on the shore of Tel Aviv, a violent clash broke out. I was, uh, happened to be in Tel Aviv at the time on the seafront uh, when it landed. And it was the most dreadful affair. We as strangers coming here and we don't understand what the problem was with the Haganah and the Etzel and, uh, and the Stern gang. And all of a sudden we see and we hear that they, they, they're sinking a ship in Tel Aviv which is carrying volunteers and also equipment. Etzel wanted to keep them, uh, the, the guns and everything to continue. They had a little army in Jerusalem fighting. And they wanted all those weapons to go to Jerusalem. And the Itzel came off the, the front line to go to get the weapons from the Altalina. And when they had come to the shore, the Palmach came in behind them. Ben Gurion said, this is enough of a good thing. You can't fight wars with different armies. Uh, I couldn't make out why. Jews were fighting Jews. It was, it was, a, it was a very a traumatic feeling for us that we're coming, the Jews are firing on Jews. Jews are sinking their own, their own ship that is coming here. And we were shouting, boys that came in the boat with me, I said, what are you shooting at me for? I'm on your side. He said, you see, and I said, you can't have two armies. Which army are you fighting for? And the Palmach disarmed all of these people. And they were sent from there into regular army units. And that was the end of the other movements. It just became the Israeli army. Once this short-lived tension had been cleared and the army consolidated into a properly unified force, there were much bigger problems to deal with. The inexperience of many soldiers, coupled with the dearth of arms, vehicles and supplies, made fighting a war on all fronts even tougher. We were not well off with arms. We were not well off with equipment. Training backgrounds varied considerably. We were idiots. We put four bombs up and I got in the cockpit and pressed and the wrong bomb dropped on the ground. It, that it didn't go off was because we didn't have set it to go off. We didn't know how to do that either. We had, we had in our own midst uh, guys who just were trigger happy. For no reason at all would pick up their rifles and start shooting, then the shooting would come back. And I mean, I thought to myself, you know, having been in proper action and survived, please, Lord, don't let me get killed in some stupid cowboy stuff like this. We sort of pinched and scraped everything we can. They got some basic supplies, and then when we came, we realized that um, it was hopeless because we hadn't got nearly enough. Occasionally they'd get the arms, but not the uh, ammunition. Or they'd get the ammunition for, of the wrong type, which wouldn't fit the arms. That's how desperate uh, it was. Make do. You know what make do is? Whatever you've got your hands on, you're fixed up. The volunteers had a presence in every sphere of the army. They really participated in all the main activities of the IDF, which of course was the ground forces, the air force and the navy. With the new army, new units and protocols had to be established. Moshe Dayan was instructed by Ben Gurion to create the first commander unit in Israel. Dayan was in charge of our platoon and his three main salient points he told us was one, as an officer, you lead from the front. Two, when you're going to battle, that the half truck or the jeep that you were driving 
must be, the back wheels must be in the trenches of the enemy. And importantly, most importantly, to see that you leave no wounded soldiers behind. As young men with vastly different training backgrounds and combat experiences, anxiety about going into battle affected all people differently. You're always nervous when you're in the army. Make no mistake about that. On the second night, lying in one of these dugouts next to my partner, a chap from England, a youngster, he said to me, look, tell me now honestly, were you scared there? And I said, no. He said, I don't believe you. I said, well, the truth is, I was too terrified to be scared. Everything looked very dark and dim because of, an, of air raids. And suddenly I began to realize that I wasn't quite as brave as I thought I was. But we took chances. Of course we were young. You don't think what's going to happen. I didn't think of danger or anything. I didn't think that I would die. You didn't have time to, f to feel that it was hopeless somehow. Nobody was afraid, even though you could hear the gu guns in the distance. You, you never felt afraid. But you get excited, but you go into a football match. The excitement and the, and, and the blood running to the, and the, and the game gets hot and everyone starts jumping and jumping. That's part of your mentality. You never think you're going to get shot, you're going to get killed. Their first priority was the procurement of arms and equipment for an army surviving on scant supplies. We had very few, very few weapons, weapon, uh, arms, weapons. We had rifles, we had grenades, we had a couple of Sten guns. And I could see that uh, weapons at that time were very depleted. But embargoes meant that these had to be acquired clandestinely. There was an arms embargo at that time and uh, from England and America we couldn't get stuff. But we were very, very friendly with France in '48. And we got in these uh, half tracks, we brought them in as agricultural implements. Everything that came into the country was flown in and smuggled into the country. And they were flown here by uh, volunteers who had not been in Israel before. The big problem was aircraft. Uh, we, we had to get aircraft and we had to get uh, weapons. When the, when the bow fighters were flown out of, uh, out of England, uh, that was a, was a great story. They were going to do a film uh, of World War II. And um, everything was laid on with a cameraman, etc., etc. And they took off and they flew on to Israel. Stealing a vehicle was part of your uh, obligation. And if the fellow objected, we, we pointed a gun at him and we took his jeep. Didn't give him much choice. Because of its strategic position geographically and its oil wealth, Russia very much wanted a foothold in the Middle East. They used Czechoslovakia, which was under their control at the time, as a front for assisting Israel. Russia had really agreed to supply assistance to Israel. But they didn't want to be the front for this uh, business, so they allowed the Czechs, which were under really Russian control, to supply us with the aircraft. The South Africans had been cultured and conditioned in their own way. They were not native to the land in which they were fighting. Everything from military discipline to language to cultural habits was foreign to them. Their integration with the native Israelis was not seamless. That wasn't easy, because we couldn't speak their language. They, were, they said, you've got to go and learn Hebrew, and I said, no, no, I didn't come to Israel to learn Hebrew. I came here to do a job. We mixed, oh, we mixed with them very nicely. But I don't think there was an integration. In fact, I think to the extent that after, in about 1950, they took a decision that by then Israel had probably the best defense force in certainly in the whole of the Middle East. 
that they were never called. They would accept volunteers happily, but they would never officially send a call for volunteers again. And yet the magnitude of their contribution was absolutely crucial to Israel's early survival. The mere presence of foreign volunteers raised the morale of the Israeli troops that they were not alone. And the knowledge that they were coming into a country that to all intents and purposes looked finished gave great courage to the, to the Jews in, in the new state. I think without the volunteer contribution there would have been no Israel because the British didn't allow Israel to have an army. Anybody even with, with a revolver could be shot. They didn't have an air force. They didn't have, know about tanks. I know that they formed the first radar unit. I know that they managed to get the first Spitfires working. The brains of the army and the air force and the navy came from the volunteers because they had the experience. The others didn't have any experience. They really established the foundations of the IDF. They contributed very well on the ground force because they were very, um, they were brave guys. The real basis of the Air Force and the medical services and radar were South Africans. Radar was one field in which the native Israelis had absolutely no experience or expertise at all. Israel's first radar unit was built almost exclusively by South Africans. The unit that we built, we didn't ever expect it to ever work. When I came, we were given a uh, laboratory at the Weizmann Institute and told to build radar. We had no equipment. And they brought us bombed out pieces of junk that the British had left behind. This middle one became our, our radar station. You can see the antenna covered in the roof. This became our power supply converted from an old um, lawnmower and this was our workshop. We virtually had made everything on that radar set. I knew a bit about antennas. So Ellie and I at night used to go to the mechanical workshop to build the antenna. And this fellow Ostroff, he had designed what was called a mattress antenna. But I couldn't find an electric motor for it. So I fashioned some bicycle pedals and a chain. Ellie was a marvellous craftsman with his hands. He, he really is highly skilled. And with his skill we converted this bicycle into an apparatus for rotating the antenna with bicycle pedals. So you have operated the radar set set there. We trained the girls <laughs> to turn the antenna I like it. But it worked. South African volunteers were also essential pillars in the medical corps. The doctors, there were 51 South African doctors here. Uh, some of them came in the difficult periods when there was virtually no medicines. The surgeons were famous, they saved lives. Nurses, there were 37. There were about 12 combat medics, one of them who was recommended for bravery, treating wounded. Um, there were about 20 something other medical trades like uh, uh, X-ray experts, uh, physiotherapists, uh, lab technicians, etc., etc. And th these numbers exceeded all the other countries put together. The medical corps sees a very different side of battle. I was caught up in the results of war. I didn't fight there, but we fought for life. One of the most important parts of my work there was training these girls from uh, camps where they still had their numbers on their arms, you know, from their camps. Training them to be Theatres, nurses and nurses. The staff would um, 
attend to, to whatever had to be done. The difference in rank was non-existent. But perhaps the most profound of the South African volunteers' contributions was in the skies. They played an essential role, not just in sourcing aircraft, but also in flying them. Without South African volunteers, there would have been no Air Force. With no Air Force, it's likely Israel would have lost the war. There were 425 Machal aircrew, uh, mainly from the Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, the largest number came from the United States, I think it was about 180. The next biggest contingent was South Africa. We had 80 guys in the Air Force. 92 non-Jews were amongst the 425. They were 21% of the air crews. We, the Machal could not have left it to the few Israelis who were pilots or otherwise, because uh, the Palestinians, the Palestinian Israelis, were only allowed to uh, be sergeants in the Royal Air Force. I mean, there were quite a lot of uh, the volunteers that came to Israel and, and Machal and also paid uh, uh, had experience during the war. I mean, where else would Israel get all of a sudden get pilots from? The South African guys did uh, a very, very important job then. They weren't up against the great air force. The, the Arabs were not, uh, not great pilots at all. They were so surprised to find out that we had aircraft, an air force. They had to just stop them in the tracks. They never got close to Tel Aviv again. They wanted the Air Force particularly because there was no foundation. The Haganah had people that had fought before. But the Air Force would be starting from scratch. These were Israelis, so typical. They'd been in the, uh, what is called Hugga Tufa, the flying club, the junior flying club. And they knew everything about flying, except flying. Some aircraft were put together from junk heaps left by the British. The guys flew anything, anything and everything. Well, yes, sir, you know what flying is all about. Flying, you're very much on your own. You're up in the skies there and... Uh, I don't know if it's heroism, but you have a feeling of superiority vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis all the other ground forces. You are up top and uh, I wouldn't call it heroic, but I would say that it's uh, a much more significant individual contribution. The Air Force was controlled by South Africans. Before we had our codes and ciphers in the Air Force, we used Afrikaans. Without the Air Force, mostly in the hands of foreign volunteers, we would never have survived the War of Independence. There were many South Africans who acquired legendary status in the nascent Israeli Air Force. We were born with wonderful godfathers. Well, I remember one night when were, we had a get-together of Machal, and uh, Ezra Weizmann, who's not a, a modest man, wasn't a modest man at all, he said, everything that I learned about aerial warfare, I learned from Sid Cohen. When Sid Cohen went back to South Africa, the Air Force sent up four Spitfires to accompany the aircraft as it left the state of Israel. That's what the Air Force thought of Sid Cohen. A pivotal moment in the War of Independence was Operation Hiram, another vital mission in which South African volunteers played a substantial role. The objective was to capture the strategically important Upper Galilee from the Arab Liberation Army. Although the battle lasted a mere two and a half days, it established Israel's northern borders. It was the night of the 28th of October. We moved and stumbled through this place all night. In a weekend, we cleared the whole of the Galilee. Three, four days, we just walked, walked right through them. And there was you know, very few casualties, took lots of prisoners, and we opened up the road there. While we were exchanging fire, they went in 
and clear the room by room. You know the old system throwing a hand grenade in, running in and shooting. And when they cleared the room, we moved around and we all met on the other side and we cleared the village house by house. And that actually set the boundaries for the north. It was really one of the wonders of the, uh, of the whole war. Israel's borders have long been in dispute. Operation Hiram secured the Upper Galilee for Israel, an area originally slated to be part of the Arab state by the UN partition plan. And we left Israel really in an unsatisfactory condition. Those armistice lines were very, very uh, unsatisfactory. Israel has no borders. Where is Israel? Where does it begin? Where does it end? Egyptians were in control of the whole of the, of the Sinai. The Jordanians were in control of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. The uh, Syrians were in control of the Golan Heights. And uh, it, was, it was left to the following wars to put all that right. Many of the Machal volunteers made the highest sacrifice for Israel's survival. Israel in that war had a population, the whole of Israel, of 650,000. 6,300 Israelis were killed in that war, civilians and military personnel. Take the percentage, no war in any war has ever had that high. Seven of the South African Michalniks lost their lives during the war. Opinions are divided over whether their contribution and the contribution of the collective efforts of all the volunteers has been overlooked. Yes. Yes, I think it has been underplayed. I don't think it's un been underplayed deliberately. I think it has just not been appreciated in the context of what it was at the time. I don't know that it needs to be appreciated. We did what we wanted to do. I don't know. They might have been able to do without me just as well. I would go so far as to say that if you asked a member of the general staff today about Machal, he doesn't know anything about it. This country is so full of problems. Milo, you forget what actually people did. Over 90 to 95 percent of the population don't even know what happened in 1948. But the, the, the great leaders knew that this was something they couldn't have done without. The ex-Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, he made a speech and he said, you came when we needed you most and you helped us. Given the extent to which Israel was outnumbered and outarmed, expectations of survival were low. The odds were against us. Why they didn't walk all over us in the first couple of days, I to this day don't understand. As far as America, Britain and the Arabs were concerned, within 10 to 14 days, the war should have been over. How did a population of just over half a million people fend off better equipped armies attacking from all sides? What was the key to Israel's victory in that war? People don't realize why the Israelis won the war. The um, feelings amongst the people was very strong. Without that, could not have survived. The fact that after millions of us had been murdered, at last the Jews had arms in their hands and were able to defend themselves, that did something to every conscious Jew in that area. I think the general feeling was that nobody had any doubts. They had to fight and they knew they were doing it. We were in the thick of things. It didn't even occur to me specifically that we wouldn't win this war. There is that atmosphere of we have to do it. That's an Israeli thing. I said that my main uh, person that I would choose to have made the victory possible would be uh, Ben Gurion, who organized and, and whiplash people into his way of thinking to carry on and to be desperate and to know that we either win or we die. There was a, 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 a radiance from him, there was a force that emanated from him which was palpable. Ben Gurion's predecessor, who like Churchill, said, the people will 
will survive, the people's mood, the people's determination, the fact that they too have no alternative. Einbrecher. You know what that means? No option. Einbrecher. There is no option. No alternative. No alternative. No alternative. No alternative. At ground level, at floor level, the Egyptians and the Jordanians hated each other's guts. Whenever we fought against the Jordanians, the Egyptians stood one way. And they were just pleased that we were hammering the Jordanians. And when we were fighting against the Egyptians, the Jordanians just stood aside and we could just carry on and fight them. If they would have all attacked us at the same time, it would have been a different story. The amount of heroism individually of people is unbelievable. nearly all went back to their countries of origin. Because it was very unsettling. And unless you had family and um, some background, it was very hard to find an entry point. I gave it 30 seconds thought. I went to a kibbutz, and when I saw they were having to milk the cows at five in the morning, I grabbed my bag and I ran for my life. The thinking and philosophy of the Jew who came from the diaspora was not the same as the indigenous person. Israel has changed drastically over the decades. Politically, socially, militarily and technologically. These men and women were there at the literal birth of the nation and have lived through every stage of the country's evolution. It's quite different today than what it was in 48. You know, there we were fighting for survival and everybody was just together. That's the most difficult of all. In 1948, there were 650,000 wonderful souls in Israel. We've we advanced tremendously, uh, technically. But the spirit of the people is not what it used to be. Isn't that tie, that close tie to the land and to the country that existed when the British ran the country and there were Jews and Arabs. The Jews wanted their, what, they, what they've got, but that feeling has dis dissipated. On the whole, our children take a lot of their past for granted because they're different, they're sabras, they've never felt the diaspora and they, they don't know what it means to have anti-Semitism. I'm very proud of Israel today. Tremendous strides in every sphere, agriculture, high tech. It's a modern, thriving community. It started to improve dramatically in a technological way and in a cultural way. And when I look at the miracle that is Israel, people say it's a miracle. It's beyond that. It was like a second creation. Well, 1948 paved the way for it, for sure. For sure.
quite a remarkable movie. We're busy turning on the chat section now so everyone will be able to chat with e each other. And if we can ask everyone, please, to turn on their cameras and we will continue the discussion now. <clears throat> you watched a, a remarkable movie. We'd love you to comment in the comment section on Facebook, on Zoom, and on YouTube. Tell us what you thought of that. It's a story of war, and it sounds so romantic, Hirsch, but let's face it, war is war, and people die, and people get injured, and people come back traumatized after war. It's not so easy. No, I, th I think so, Howie, and you, you know, what struck me about last week's documentary and about this is, is exactly what they said, is that, you know, the, the Arabs the Arabs could go back to their countries and, and live to fight another day, and and these Makhalniks and, and those fighting for Israel's life didn't have a choice, you know, and uh, and so you know it was it was almost the the, the triumph of of hope over over reality. And so let's start hearing about some of the families and some of the people involved. Then, Saul, I want to speak to you. Uh, flying is in your family blood. Yes, um, my father Smokey uh, was in the South African Air Force and fought in the Second World War. Uh, my mother, who was a trained meteorologist in the South African Air Force, she joined. For one purpose and one purpose only, she believed she could fly in the back seat of Harvard's back then. So she had flying in her blood. Uh, we have myself, my brother, um, a, grand a grandson. So we have a, a, a fair representation of uh, pilots in the Israeli Air Force. So tell us about your parents. They get married and what happens? They get married in South Africa. Yes, they were scheduled to marry later on in '48. Uh, my father uh, decided he would leave, that he wanted to volunteer. This is probably around February. Um, he told my mother that they would need to postpone the wedding as he was um, heading to Palestine. And she informed him that they would not be postponing. They would be bringing the wedding forward. They married um, in late uh, April, 22nd of April, 48. And... Um, Two weeks later, they were on a plane together heading to Palestine. So they came here together with the first group of South Africans. Uh, the flight took three days, as we heard in the movie, um, to arrive. And they never told your grandparents where they were going? No, no, they were not allowed to mention. It was a, a, a secret at the time. Um, their excuse was that they were traveling to Europe for a honeymoon and that my father had some business, international business, which was quite ridiculous. He had nothing to do with activities outside of South Africa, but they ended up um, here and they arrived at, uh, six days before the war broke out. And uh, my father was on the first uh, military flight on the 14th of May. Um, he um, went up with Boris Senior and, and a cameraman and they, photographed the Syrians or Jordanians on the east side, on the east border, as they were approaching the border of Israel. So um, they saw it all build up. And uh, when he landed, he realized that this is going to be a very, very difficult war. And a lot of the stories we heard in the movie um, were those forces um, coming in from the east. You told me an amazing story about your mother when you came home from, from pilot school and you started telling her about some of the things that you were learning. Tell us that story. Uh, um, I, both parents were very modest, so they, they barely shared stories. It wasn't a big issue. It was they did their part, and um, I never really understood what went on. I was at pilot school. I was uh, 19. Uh, I come home one weekend, and I, I say to my mother, um, you know, she says, How, how's it going? I said, it's, it's wonderful. We, we're actually doing aerobatics. And uh, I knew she had some flying experience uh, relating to that uh, time in the, um, the meteorology department. And she said, well, what aerobatics are you guys doing? I said, you know, we do the loop, we do a barrel roll. And so, and she says, what else are you doing? And I continue and, and she's asking me more questions. And at the end, I say to her, you know, we do this fascinating uh, a maneuver called a barrel, uh, a, a slow roll. You roll around a, a line of sight going into the sky. She says to me, isn't that the maneuver where you use opposite stick and rudder? Now, anyone who understands flying, 
it shows that this is an expert pilot talking. I was blown. I was shocked. I realized and actually just today, my mother passed away two weeks ago. I collected her logbook today and I was going through the different flights where she learned these different exercises. So, Amazing. Yeah. So we're going to come back to you in a few moments yeah. and we're going to ask you to tell some stories about your parents and the stories that they told you. But Hirsch, you want to ask some questions of Joey? Yeah, Joey, thanks for, for coming on and then sharing what I would imagine some deeply personal family stories. We were actually together at a Shabbat dinner a couple of weeks ago and uh, I'm not sure how we got into the subject and you, you told me a remarkable story about your dad, which we'll get to in a moment. But I, I want to find out from, from you, your dad, Naftali, I think he had a nickname of Taxi, if I read correctly in the book. How did you first find out about his his role in the war? Was it something that he spoke about openly? Were there pictures on a mantelpiece? piece? about you know how he told you when you how you first find out about the story of your dad in the war thanks for so um good evening everybody so i think firstly i'd just like to say a huge thank you to etienne jason and sharif for putting this together i think it's a beautiful story and it's been a long time in coming and thank you for you know for putting it together in such a good way and Saul, uh, i'd like to wish you a long life for your mom um, and I saw a great story about your dad on YouTube. I think it was when you turned 100 and yeah. you guys all went up on a flight with him. I uh, yes. suggest everyone on this, on this webinar to have a look at that video. It, it's, it's really it's inspiring and beautiful. So I think, Herschel, the first thing to answer your question was um, how it started off the webinar by asking the creators of this documentary, was there a theme? Was there a common thread? I can, I would never be, you know, I could never sit here and say why these people were motivated to do it. I don't know what that is. But the common thread that I saw throughout my dad's friends, and if you've watched documentaries on any of the guys, Aza Weitzman, Ben Gurion, they all had one story. We weren't heroes. We were there and we were at the right place at the right time with the skill that was needed. And that for me was the common thread amongst all of these people who were involved. We asked, it was, the question was asked in the documentary of, do you feel you were not recognized? And I asked my dad that, that very, very question. And he said, there's nothing to recognize. We didn't do anything special. We were needed and we did what we had to do. So I think to answer your question directly, we, we found out about it from little snippets that he spoke about, but he never really spoke about it in a big way. We, we begged him and pleaded with him in his later years when he wasn't well to document the story. We wanted to get a scribe for him to put it together. And it's just not what they're all about. He just said, no, you know, it, it is what it is. So the information we got from our dad, my siblings and I was more probed out of him than volunteered, if, that's, if I could put it that way. And which, do, do you know about the unit in which he, he fought and his, his role and how long he was there for? Yeah, so he got recruits of uh, Boris Senior. So he got his wings here in the South African Air Force. Um, and then Boris Sr. started recruiting pilots. He was one of the guys who took one of the Fairchilds here in South Africa. They left, I think, on about the 11th of April. They arrived there sometime in May. He actually spent his 21st birthday in Khartoum. Um, and then they became part of what was called 101 Squadron, um, which was the first squadron in the Israeli Air Force. I think today it's 69 Squadron. They've still got the same emblem of the little skeleton's head with wearing flying goggles and a flying hat. And um, they, they were the first squadron and they flew the Spitfires. They took the Spitfires from Czechoslovakia to Israel. And one of the few stories he did tell me is how on the day they arrived, he got thrown into a Tiger Moth and uh, they flew Molotov cocktails from, from the back of a Tiger Moth onto the enemy. So I think it was very, very simple, very crude and the story of that generation is they just made do with what they had. They were extremely creative um, and they just made do with what they had. I mean, if you listen to the stories and you watch the documentary, they organized Spitfires from Czechoslovakia to come into Israel under just so humble about it. And then he stayed in the, in the military for about two, three years. And then he actually went on to join El Aul and he was one of the first pilots and then Lau, Ruben, Nurin, Ruben Nurinsky was on the documentary. Him and Ruben were pilots together in Lau. Just amazing. So, 
Amazing story. So one of the interesting features is that a number of the people who went later became mayors. So we had, for example, Mayor of, San, uh, as of Santon, uh, Morris Ectus, and, uh, and we also had Harold Maggot, who became mayor of Johannesburg. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, Eddie Maggot. Uh, Harold, you, you brought me a copy of your dad's book, A Man of His, of his Word. Uh, tell us about your dad, Harold. Well, he was one of the, uh, having left school, he missed the Second World War and uh, at the age of 19 had to. Uh, change a birth certificate so he could get to Israel. Uh, left at the age of 19 on the 15th of December, 1946, on a truck with eight people, Harry, Harry Bloch, Morris Gulp, who was in the movie, Henry Harris, Benny Miller, Fivey Nossov, what's his name? Noah Senets, Izzy Reback, Army Goldblatt, and they, Left, they were given a truck by the, the Zionist Fed, left from Pretoria, as I said, December the 15th. They didn't get to Pretoria before they had their first breakdown. And that was a recurrent thing with that truck. They needed new tires and new petrol <laughs> pumps and all the rest of it, all the way through Africa. And eventually, got to Sudan and driving into Sudan through uh, quite a forested area, apparently, um, my father, Eddie, and uh, Henry Harris were sitting on top of the cab, you know, when you sit in the, you visualize the old trucks where the driver's side was higher than the co-driver's side and there were spare wheels on top of the truck. And they were sitting there in, in these, like in a basket, and they got hit by an overhanging tree. Fortunately, my father, although he was thrown like some 30 or 40 feet uh, behind the truck, uh, was okay, although very bruised and battered. But uh, Henry Harris uh, had the vertebra broken and had to return to South Africa. So it basically aborted their trip because they had to sell the truck to get him back to South Africa. He then... Uh, his second uh, foray was to fly from here, from Palmitfontein, where all the planes left at that time, before Jan Smut or, or Tambo Tem was thought of, and they flew to Rome. Uh, because they were Irgun sympathizers, they were not allowed to fly into Israel, and eventually, however, they managed to, to get to Israel, three of them, um, and uh, we're told we're going to land in Haifa. There's arms and ammunition on board. We're going to a dark side of the, the airport and you're going to jump out and just run and try and make contact with somebody. And that's what they did. They, they got out, they, they ran, they managed to get onto a bus, which the British <laughs> stopped, and they were then asked to show their papers. Anyway, he and Mori Egdis were sitting next to each other and he said to Mori, look, just show them your passport, but show it upside down. Maybe they won't realize that we are here to fight for Israel. And they got through. Um, yeah, uh, I've got lots of stories I can tell you, but I'll leave it for a little later. Wow, oh, amazing. Hirsch, let's hear some more stories. Yeah, Tony, great to have you back. We thought we would lost you there for, for a, a moment. When you when you watch the, the documentary, um, tell me what emotions it stirred and tell me your, your family story as it relates to the War of Independence. Tony, are you there? Can you hear us? Tony, can you can you speak and let's see if we can hear you? No, you're right. Let's ask you to unmute. No, are you still on mute, Tony? 
No. Maybe let's, while let's while Tony while yeah. Tony maybe tries to sort that out, uh, let's go to Rodney Katsu. Tell us about your family, Rodney. Um, well, thank you for everything, um, Kawi. Um, my father, Joe Katsu, he was he was a bit older when he volunteered as a pilot in the in the War of Independence. He was about twenty seven then. And his story, really, he was a veteran of the Second World War. He was 18. Sorry, Rod, if I can stop you for a second. Your camera seems to have gone off. Oh, dear. Sorry. So we've just... Sorry about that. Yes, great. Okay, so tell father, us about your yeah, dad. He was a veteran of the Second World War, and um, he was initially an infantryman up north, fought uh, um, on a main by deer. North Africa, um, was, amongst other things, he was wounded, he was taken prisoner for a while, then came back to South Africa and um, uh, transferred to the Air Force. He got his wings in South Africa. And then for the last part of the war, he flew uh, Marauder bombers, the B-26s uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, he was, his perhaps story uh, in, in volunteering was a bit different to what I've heard of the others. He was, a, as I said, a bit older. He was actually approached. Uh, he said that although it was a, a, supposed to be a, a, a volunteer process, uh, pilots were in such short demand that he was asked to volunteer in a way. It wasn't such an easy decision for him, as I say, a bit older. And perhaps one area that hasn't been touched this evening is the action of their parents, my grandparents. Uh, they were vehemently against him going, um, uh, having had the experience of of the Second World War behind them already. Um, and eventually an agreement was made between the Zionist Fed, my father and, and, and my grandparents, that he would go not as a combatant, but the, that he would fly only in support uh, spheres of the war. Uh, they were going to, he was going to fly a, um, a, a, an ambulance aircraft. Needless to say, when he finally arrived in, in Israel via Rome, um, no one had ever heard this agreement or story. There were no ambulance planes, and he was he was um, assigned directly to a. It was called a Flight Thirty Five Squadron. Uh, it flew out from near Rehovot, and it consisted of seven Norseman planes. Now the Norsemen were just the opposite of what he flew in the Second World War. They were they were little transport planes. I don't think they were. They were probably smaller than a Cessna. Um, and they were built for the tundra region of North. They were, they were supplied by the Canadians and uh, they were built for the tundra region rather than the hot Middle East uh, climate. And they even had to be converted from having skis on them to, to make them to, to have wheels added for landing. So they were very difficult and dangerous planes to fly. Um, uh, the, he flew it, both on bombing sorties and also uh, supplies to Sodom, which was at that point isolated from the rest of the Jewish occupied uh, Palestine, Israel. Um, uh, also, very interesting stories about how they had to modify the plane, took the side door off, uh, had a little ramp put inserted, and uh, when he flew the plane, he had to veer to the left, and then he had what they call bomber chuckers at the back, and sometimes there were schoolboys throwing out, out, out the bombs. Um, he, he also had the misfortune of actually crash landing one of the planes. Thankfully, him and his co-pilot that was landing in Sodom uh, survived. It seemed miraculous that they both did survive. It was his, his co-pilot was Roy Shapiro, who, who sadly died in a car accident in the 1960s. But uh, they survived. He survived. And, and um, you know, uh, conditions were extremely, extremely difficult for flying. Planes were never... Uh, maintained. There were no spare parts. Radar was rudimentary. They had to fly at, at night or under cover of, of, of cloud to avoid, uh, uh, first of all, because the plane could not handle the heat, particularly when landing, and also to avoid uh, Egyptian spitfires. Um, uh, and, and um, yeah, it, 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 you know, I think we romanticize a bit about, about, about being there and, and what they achieved and what they did, but, but life was very, very hard. Um, and uh, eventually, I, I think to, in, in, in today's terms, I think my father did suffer a, a post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and and uh, he, he eventually was, was grounded and, and returned to South Africa.
I, I think uh, Marianne uh, is asking us, can we repeat the numbers of the population of Israel at the time? 650,000, I think that's correct. And about uh, about uh, 5% of... of, uh, of uh, about, about 1%, about 6,000 uh, 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 soldiers lost, their, lost their, their lives. I mean, when you think about that in, in terms of 1%, as uh Mikhail Tepperson said not not in the history of the world wars has a has a nation ever lost that kind of percentage of its of its people in battle so before we go back and speak to Saul Simon uh I have put out a call and a message to say that if you are um and you would like to join us please in fact do do so and we'll promote you onto the panel but uh, and i see that ralph judah has asked to be promoted so we'll do that right now uh but before we go back to saul simon i want to speak to jason hoff you put this amazing movie together it really really is i think so inspiring and you can see uh all of the people who've told us that um tonight what was it like for you to be able to tell the story um, well, without excluding Etienne, who, who's really, I mean, besides Sharit's brainchild, my passion, I suppose, and salesmanship, and, and Etienne's really his craft and creativity in that. So no self-aggrandizing here, to quote the words of the late Victor Katz, who's one of the Machal Nicks, I must just tell you. And that segues into the story. So the overarching thing, like I mentioned last week, was... There were so many ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, you know, several people in the comments here, and, and it's been mentioned as well, people who cheated their ID books or tried to cheat their ID books to, to make sure they were 18. There were 16-year-olds trying to get to Israel to fight, to be part of it. And that's part of the, I think, the ideology at the time or the, or the passion or, or, the, or the responsibility that people, I mean, youngsters, 16, 17-year-olds felt. And funny enough, Nati Kirsch, actually, when we took him the copy of the movie to say, here's the movie we, you helped us make. He said, everyone one year older than me from Potchefstroom, they got in and I couldn't get in because I was too young. And so that's that's part of the background. And, and, and something I just want to mention, because I've read the comments quite extensively here. There's Les Belkind, who related to Sid Cohn, still lives in Johannesburg. Uh, Joe Wolf's kids. Um, David Mandelsfry, Gordon, and, and I, I don't think anyone can deny how arresting the story is when, when Gordon Mandelsfry uh, tells the story of what happened in that tiny shul in the Free State when the first evidence from the war came, and, and it motivated people to say, there is no ways we're going to, we, we can't lose, there's ain bray ra, there's no chance, and, and that really existed amongst everybody, and um, just a note to, to Saul Simon, you know, I wish you a long life. And, and I had the, the absolute pleasure at the, the last day of this shoot, wrapping up the entire thing was with Smokey and Myra in, in their home in Israel. And they took us out for dinner. And it was just the, the most wonderful way to, to wrap up this whole thing, to, to speak off the cuff, the most kind and wonderful and passionate and committed people. And they, they took us to this fabulous restaurant around the corner. And I've never seen anybody eat like Smokey, I must tell you. He was like a teenager. And uh, it was just, you know, a, a beautiful way to to wrap up the this long, you know, process that that we had come to. So, yeah, I mean, I've got made notes about people that I've seen here in the in the notes, but you know, in, in the in the comments here. But uh, overarching was these relationships that I had the, the the privilege to build thereafter. I used to go and visit Victor Katz just about every Friday before Shabbos in Highlands North and talk shit and drink whiskey. And uh, Ruth Stern, every time I went back to Israel, we would have dinner with Ruth Stern or Dan Kenny, which is uh, William Kentridge's f uh, first cousin, um, and so on and so forth. And it's just a pleasure to see that uh, the, the offspring of all of these remarkable people who did remarkable, uh, you, ordinary people who did remarkable things are here. So uh, a, a pleasure from, from my side. And uh, I see both both sides here, Joe Wolf's kids. Joe Wolf was so generous with us for a full day. We drove him all over the country telling his stories. You can see him in different parts. And uh, so, yeah, thanks to everybody. It's brilliant to see youngsters, uh, the, the the children, I should say, the youngsters of these Machalniks uh, participating. So that that's my, my first comment. Well, let's quickly talk to another youngster who's joined us, and that's Ralph Judah. We finally track you down, Ralph. Yeah, yeah, you can run, but you can't hide, apparently. 
Apparently so. So as I mentioned earlier, I uh, I did my law articles for your father. And that's yeah. where I heard the stories of people like Boris Senior and Cecil Margot and uh, and Smokey Simon from your dad. Tell us about Dov. So, so Dov was, uh, grew up uh, in, a, in an extraordinarily religious Jewish family. He, uh, although that probably wasn't apparent to you while you were working for him, uh, the, the religious. He used, to, he used to call me Matthew. And when I'd say, why Matthew? He said, Matthew, verse 2, chapter 7, seek and ye shall find. Yes, indeed. Um, he said that to me quite a lot too, if my memory serves me well. The uh, so he, he the, his 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 father was a, a, he, a Hebrew teacher and a Torah scholar, but uh, being a man of Torah, he was also a fairly rabid Jabotinskyite, and so the family was infused with with Zionism, uh, and after after coming back. From the Second World War, um, my my grandmother was apparently not particularly thrilled to learn that he was quite ready to turn around and go back to Israel. And the circumstances were interesting because he, in during the Second World War, he had been in the artillery, and he, as he related the story to me, when he was in a foxhole in Alamein, he looked up at the guys in the aircraft. And thought to himself, you know, this is not a good place for a Jewish boy to be. I want to be up there. So he left the artillery in 41 and joined the Air Force. Uh, and he, he qualified as a navigator. And then he joined 24 Squadron, which was under the command at the time of Cecil Margo. And Trevor Sussman was the, the pilot to whom my father was, 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 was allocated, if you will. And as uh, as those of you who are familiar with the uh, with the history of the Israel Air Force know, um, the Cecil and Trevor were the guys asked by the powers that be in Israel to come across and help with the formation of the Air Force. So my dad had already made the decision to leave for Israel. Same situation as the Katsus. The uh, the his, his wedding was set for later in 48. Uh, he went to my mother and he said, I'm going to Israel. You can come with me if you like. She said exactly the same thing. She said, uh, actually, we're going to accelerate the marriage and we're going to go together. And shortly after the Declaration of Independence, my mom and dad, having gotten married at the Oval Shul in Joburg, literally went virtually directly to the airport and took the three-day journey. They went through Cyprus in order to get there as tourists to Cyprus, and then flew directly from Cyprus to Israel. When they landed at, at Lord Airport, they landed in an air raid. And my mother, who was dressed in the typical travel finery of 1948, in a hat and a coat and all sorts of other things, got summarily bumped into a ditch by the person standing next to her as the air raid siren went off and lost her hat, which was for her a mortifying experience. So the, the beginning of her experience in Israel was interesting and complicated. My dad immediately started flying in those little flying boxes, not as a, as a pilot, because he wasn't a pilot, but as, as the originator of the bomb chuckers. And he described to me during one of my conversations with him, flights over Nablus and Janin, where they didn't have bombs, so they threw bottles uh, soda bottles out of the plane because they whistled on the way down and sounded like bombs and exploded. Uh, not to create much damage, but psychological trauma. And he described a bunch of those. But then Cecil and and uh, Trevor Sussman arrived, got the got the air force uh, organized, and Cecil asked my father to to head up air operations. Uh, and Smokey was the director of air operations, and my father was the uh, the Rosh air operations for 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 the whole performance for the duration of the war. He, my mother, ran the side the Safa room, which was the operations room, um, and so both of them were very deeply engaged 
in the war. My dad had grown up in Habonim and, and was infused with a Zionist fervor. And so there was never a question as to whether he would go there. The question was how quickly he could get there. And in talking to him, it was very clear that having lived through the Second World War, he viewed you know, the, the risk issue was something that he viewed as just another mission. You know, you, you, you say, you, he, he, he also had been flying the B-26s over, over Italy in, in 24 Squadron. And so for him, it was just a, it was another mission, this one perhaps more important than the previous one for him, uh, the previous one being the Second World War a, as a whole. Um, and they, they stayed there until mid-1950, when, uh, when my mother basically decided that she, she wanted to go home. A, she wanted to get her hat back, and B, she wanted to go back to a place that was a little less chaotic, a little more welcoming. And a lot safer, uh, and and I think they were at severe risk of having me being born at that particular point in time, and so she just wanted to go home. Otherwise, I think my dad would gladly stay. Um, well, I I, I want to ask Dave Bloom, who's joined us, because Dave, do you know all of these people? You you're chairman of World Machal. I um I I know that many of them. I certainly know many of them, and I'm happy to say I work closely with Saul. And I wanted to just tell you that um, we just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Saul was very involved in creating a memorial for a very special battle that took place two weeks after the declaration of the War of Independence. It's it's recorded as the first battle sortie by the Israel Air Force uh, two weeks after the war, the the, the Israel was declared. Um, four Messerschmitts flown by two Machalnikim, one was a South African, Eddie Cohen, um, uh, Lou Lennart, uh, Ezer Weizmann, and Modi Alon. Flew four uh, of these Messerschmitts that had been brought from Czechoslovakia and put together literally overnight. They didn't even have a chance to test the planes before they flew them. And they flew down to a, an area near Ash, what is today Ashdod. And they attacked a column of Egyptians that had made their way, who were literally 25, 30 kilometers from Tel Aviv, who were on the banks of a river near Ashdod. And um, the Egyptians had no clue that Israel had any planes at that time. Um, and they managed to basically help to stop that advance of the Egyptians. Uh, Eddie Cohen, unfortunately, did not make it. He was killed in that attack. The story is that uh, Ezra Weizmann, his plane actually, the, his guns jammed. He only managed to shoot, I think, one shot from each of his guns. Um, Lou Lennart was a very experienced American pilot from, who had served in the Pacific in the Second World War. Uh, and um, there's another story of how, you know, there were two Tsabarim, two Israelis who were born. I mean, Ezra Weizmann uh, had trained with the RAF. In fact, he trained, he got his wings, I think he got his wings in Guelo in, in Rhodesia. He certainly trained in, in Rhodesia to fly. Uh, I myself am from Rhodesia, so that's a kind of a nice connection. But anyway, the, the Mahalnikim, uh, guys like Migdal, Stepperson, Smokey Simon, the South Africans have kept the organization going for many, many years. And we as a kind of second generation, Saul and his sister and a few others are maintaining the organization. And we continue to try and record stories, tell stories. And uh, we have an extensive website with archives of many, many hundreds of stories and, and the records of all the people who came from many different countries, not just South Africa, but certainly with, uh, many of the South Africans have been involved in maintaining World Machal in, until today. Tommy, I want to just try and get uh, Tony back on. I'm not sure, Tony, are, are you are you able to talk to us? I know we, we've lost your your picture. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Um, maybe maybe just while Tony's seeing if you can get back on. I just want to. Um, Joey sent me a picture. Joey, I'm going to try and share the screen, and maybe you can just talk us through. This um, this this picture you sent, I think of 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 your dad with with uh, Ben Gurion. 
Yeah, so uh, that's something that we felt chance. My my nephew who lives in Israel was going was doing a tour through the country and he went took his kids to Ben Gurion's house. That his old house is a museum, and uh, he was just looking through a drawer that was actually closed. It wasn't a display at all. And in the drawer, he found this picture. I think this is when Ben Gurion came to meet the guys and was congratulating them and giving them their wings. And my dad is the second guy at the back there. Um, in uniform with his cap on. And I mean, I didn't even know that he had, you know, that this had even happened. None of us knew. And my nephew sent me this picture. He said, is this Zayda? I said, yeah, that's definitely Zayda. Take the picture. He said, no, 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 I can't do that. I'll just take a picture of it. I said, no, no, take the picture. But he said, no. So yeah, and again, I think that just goes back to how these guys just never spoke about it. I mean, my personal experience at least is they just carried on as if they did something and it's over. We did what we had to do. Did you see other pictures, Joey, of, of your dad? Did he come back with uh, uh, pictures uh, from the war or just really the stories of the, and, and as you said, just the little snippets that he, he, he told you? I've got, we've got some pictures that we treasure. I think there was a bit of a superstition of not taking pictures in uniform, um, especially of pilots. So, uh, but we have got some pictures. Uh, all my kids up on there. Walls have got a picture of my dad in uniform, which is a very rare picture. Um, I've got the picture of the Fairchild. Someone spoke about the Fairchilds that they left with here. I've got a picture of that. So not too many, but we have got, I've got the um, emblem that he wore on his cap of 101 Squadron, the first squadron in the Israeli Air Force. Um, I wear that on a bracelet every day. It's always on my arm. So we've got a few things. Unfortunately, not enough, but we've got a few things. So just, hey, just one I, more. I, I, sorry, Jay. Just one continue. more. Beautiful story, and I think Saul may back me up here. But flying enthusiasts will arguably say that the Spitfire was one of the best planes ever built, especially in its time. And uh, there was one flying Spitfire, Spitfire left in South Africa, and I took my dad to see it. I don't think he ever looked at any of us kids or my mom with such loving eyes. He looked at this plane and stroked this plane like it was a long lost lover. I was actually quite jealous, to be honest. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Thanks, Hirsch, I, I want to show some pictures uh, because uh, uh, this is a picture of the late uh, Mori Agdis sent to me by his daughter. That's him um, in, the, in his tank over there. And also today, I don't know if you remember the name Professor Ruben Scher. Professor Ruben Scher is probably one of the most famous South African doctors, and uh, he led the initiative to treat HIV AIDS patients in South Africa. You may you may recognize him from kind of these sorts of pictures. But uh, here is a picture of him in Israel as part of the Machal and some of his uh, his uh, epaulets, I think you call call them, that were sent to me today by uh, one of his sons. So, so Saul, one of the questions asked a little earlier from someone, in fact, from Morris Kruger is, after the war, what did your parents decide? Did they stay in Israel? Did they come back to South Africa? What was their future? Uh, they were asked to stay on uh, for a year to help establish the, the Israeli Air Force. After all, it was built during wartime, so the, it was... A, a total, I wouldn't say chaos, but they had to really get things in line in no time during um, pretty uh, hectic uh, fighting. So uh, he was quite experienced from the Second World War, understood how operations need to be organized. Uh, my mother helped build the METS section uh, in Serona in Tel Aviv. Uh, they spent a year uh, helping establish the Air Force. After that year, they were asked to stay on for another year. And that's where my parents decided they would negotiate six more months. And then in the mid fifties, they headed back to South Africa, pretty similar uh, to uh, Ralph's story. And uh, us four kids, we were born in South Africa before coming back to Israel in 62. So Jason, I, I want all our filmmakers, I, I think they're still on, but they don't have their cameras on, but I want them to come and take a bow to our audience. We'll, we will do one last whip around uh, from everyone just to get one last story from each of their families. But before we do that, I'd love Etienne and Sharit to come on and tell us what this movie means to them. So if I can ask you guys to please unmute yourselves and uh, turn on your cameras. I think the filmmakers really have to take some remarkable credit here.
Etienne. Sorry, I'm back now. I wasn't on for a little while there. Thanks for unmuting me. <laughs> um, it, it, it was a terrific story, you know, as a, as a person who's, who's not Jewish, Jason and I were business partners for a long time. Um, I, I, I knew very little about the story and I knew nothing about the history of Michal and Sharit brought the project to us. And every person's story was just so, um, so rich and fascinating. And I'm so happy that we got a chance to record it and archive it and keep it for posterity um, before these and before these people passed away and these stories were lost forever. It was a great privilege to be involved with it and to meet and um, hear everyone's stories and, and, and put it together forever. So, Sharit, we are losing many of the Machalniks. Most of them have, have in fact, passed. There's still some around in Israel and the United States, and hopefully there's some in South Africa as well. Tell us what's the next story that we have to actually not lose before it's too late. Well, I think you're going to have to pull Jason into that since he's still very much involved in the industry. Um, yeah. So, so, Jace, that's up to you because I know he's got some more stories that need to be told and that he's got in the pipelines. Cool. So, Jason, um, you, go, you gave us an inkling a little earlier in this week, last week, Sunday, in fact, uh, of what's next for you. Yes. So, Sharet, uh, assuming you don't have a film project for us, which the door is always open, just by the way, you can come in any time, no problem. We'll stay in your flat in Natanya, no problem, and we'll shoot it. But... For now, we've got the a story that myself and my friend Lisa Esses have been speaking about for 17 years. Her mother was a Libyan Jewish exile from 1967 and forms part of the Sfardi Mizrahi exodus from the ancient Jewish homelands of Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq, etc. And it is not very well told. It's not. The, it's fairly well documented, but it hasn't been put into a movie that is simultaneously entertaining as well as educational and very watchable. So this has been germinating for 17 years, but now we are actually getting started. We've, we've got a fair, a fair beginning for our fundraising and it's a much, it's a much bigger film because it's, it, tra it traverses several continents as well. And, and many, many countries we'd like to go to Morocco and Tunisia uh, we definitely going to shoot in London, of course, Israel. A lot of the, 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 the Libyan Jews, for example, live in Italy. A lot of the Tunisians, Algerians live in France. And uh, it's an untold story. And I think, uh, I think that's going to be, you know, that's going to be our, our next um, Jewish-themed film. And please, God, we get it together. But we, we are starting now in London at the end of the month for a few extra interviews. So God willing, Baruch Hashem. We will, be, we will be here in a year's time or maybe 18 months and everyone will come and listen. And all the Ashkenazim will say, wow, I didn't know that. And let's uh, learn about the Sephardis and the Mizrahim. So that's the one. Cool. I, I, I see uh, uh, Shoal Zevi wants to come on and Shoal, I'm going to try to see if I can promote you just for a second to, to be very, very quick, just to tell one story. And then Herschel's going to do a... Do a, a whip around. Uh, so, Shul, you say you don't have a camera on, but uh, I think you may be able to have your microphone on. Shul, can can you hear us? Shul, can you speak? No, doesn't seem to to be working. Hirsch, so the final whip around is to you. Uh, Howie, maybe just to share, I've just got another picture sent to me, um, and you know, it always kind of makes it um, more real. But this is this is a picture uh, sent to me from Richard Friedland uh, with a, a, a tank that they had, I think, captured, and uh, Richard's dad, Bernie Friedland, is on the on the left. Can uh, I say there is absolutely no doubt in my mind? looking at this picture who Richard and Peter's father is without any doubt. <laughs> and, and I think uh, second from the right is, is uh, Morris Ectus. So uh, just, you know, once again, um, amazing pictures of, of, of amazing individuals and, and maybe just to end on, on a whip around, you know, just um, from everyone is just to talk about the, 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 the responsibility or, or the, or the obligation to continue to tell 
the story of, of your amazing parents and, and what they did for the state of Israel and, and how do you make sure that the story of ordinary people who became heroes in your families is passed down to the next generation and to the grandchildren and to the, the great grandchildren to preserve the, this amazing legacy and this amazing story. How, how do you how do you go about doing that? Uh, if I may. Please, Dave. So, you know, we we have this very extensive website and we continue to collect stories on the on the story of Machal. And I invite anybody who's participated in this evening to contact me at uh, worldmachal at uh, gmail.com. And I'm happy to help pr continue preserving the story. And uh, we have a small volunteer committee. Um, we have representatives in the US we have people in France, we have people in South Africa and here in Israel. And we really would like to cooperate with anybody who wishes to uh, contribute a story. We have wonderful recordings of, of Smokey Simon, of Joe Wolf, of, of Tepperson, of Migdal Tepperson, extensive interviews with them on our website. And these are just ways in which we continue to record and maintain the history. So please, Dave, can I can I ask? Stan says, "Is the Machal website working?" He got a warning. Yeah, so I have to warn you, and I'll be I'll be frank with you. We've had a security issue on Chrome. If you go to the website machal.org.il using your Edge browser, you can access it. Unfortunately, Chrome is giving us a bit of a headache at the moment. Uh, there is a problem there. We also have a very active Facebook group, and people are contributing daily. You can see a report. On that same ceremony that I did, that I told you about, the Ada Lom ceremony we did a couple of weeks ago, we have a film and we have pictures of that ceremony, and we'll, we have almost daily people posting material on that on the Facebook. What's the name of the Facebook group? Go to go to Facebook and look for World Machal. World Machal. Okay, great. That's Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone at Jewish Report for putting this together. It's really been wonderful. The film has been around, I think. Am I right? Since about 2011, but still, it's great. Always great to see it. Yeah. So maybe just everyone give us a sort of a, a parting comment and and uh, the emotion that watching this evoked in you. And and how do you tell the story to your children and get grandchildren and make sure that it's it's passed down through the generations? Who are you uh -huh. directing that at? Uh -huh. oh, let's kick. Yeah, so let's kick off with you, Saul. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just before I address that, that question, two uh, minor points that I think are important. One is um, the ingenuity that went on in 48, driven by Machalniks, in my view, is the start of Startup Nation. What the Machalniks did in 48, they innovated in no time, incredible technology that enabled the Air Force to be that much more powerful and effective, and, and not just the Air Force. Uh, the, the, the radar story before is just phenomenal. Can you imagine the only radar in the war was hand built by pieces of junk assembled with that bicycle uh, chain uh, uh, swiveling it? Um, aircraft that were flown Spitfires from um, Czechoslovakia through Yugoslavia, five and a half hours in the air because they took out every single pound of weight so they could put in extra uh, fuel tanks, and they made it. They didn't crash without test flying. Uh, unbelievable ingenuity. I think that uh, instigated and uh, was a, a great push for the belief that we can basically do anything with technology if you put the, you know, your, your mind together. Uh, beyond that, the other point to me is the bravery of those guys, um, and especially those that fought in World War II. I could never understand how my father, after five years of flying in the Second World War, where 60% of air crews, they were annexed to the RAF, were either killed, uh, wounded, or pr taken prisoner of war, 40% chance of making it back home alive, and then two years, two and a half years later, making a decision to come and volunteer he decided to come before the war broke out. Why do you come before war breaks out? At least wait for it. Why are you coming to a country that has no air force? Those little Piper Cubs or Oysters at the time were not an air force. You had nothing to fly. 
Um, I could never get an answer. I re repeated this question every couple of years over a stretch of 20 years. I personally participated in the uh, Yom Kippur War, which was a tough war, my first war. I didn't have enough appreciation for 48 uh, because not many stories, as I mentioned, were shared at home. And I thought that was the worst of all wars. You surprised, you attacked, and we were very, very tough war. And after that, I began understanding what went on in 48. And I realized that Yom Kippur War was, was kids' play compared to what they did in 48. And these guys volunteered after years of fighting and risking their lives uh, with the odds of losing a limb or life. Uh, were absolutely tremendous. I, I can't express enough the gratitude I have for their bravery. So the main point that I would like somehow, if we can convey to the next generation, is you don't find many brave people today. How do you convey the notion of bravery? And uh, it just goes beyond words. Um, you know, we try and do a little, we've had on, on the Machal um, committee, we've had a couple of discussions, how do we get the story out around the Adalom event we had two weeks ago, we took the story to schools, we went to about 10 different schools and, and we presented the story to make sure that the kids and they were all not just the kids, the teachers had never heard about it. Um, and that one event, by the way, on the 29th of May, 48, was the single most crucial event in the war of liberation. That was the tipping point. Uh, we would have had we lost that point when the Egyptians would have continued into Tel Aviv, the game would have been over. And from that point onward, fortunately, the tides uh, began to turn slowly and then they uh, sped up as the months went by. So, and thank you very much for this wonderful event um, uh, um, uh, for the Jewish Report and for you, Howard, and um, for Jason and all the rest of the crew. Wonderful event. Excellent. Thank you. Harold, some, some part, parting thoughts and, and, and wise words. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the wise words, but uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure what kind of time restraint we have. Uh, I'll just carry on from where I left off. Um, where my father and Mori Egdis and Stanley Burr found themselves eventually was in a place called Tel Litwinski, where they hung around waiting to get posted and to do something. And a fellow by the name of MacDonald from the British Tank Corps arrived and said, who can speak English? So the three of them put up their hands and they became the first, I believe, three people in the 82nd uh, Tank Corps in Israel, which was the first Tank Corps in Israel. They uh, succeeded in obtaining three, well, two tanks. There were three British uh, uh, commanders that were prepared to break through the fencing in Cromwell tanks and to bring them and give them to, uh, to, to the Israeli, uh, the IDF. And only two made it. The third one crashed into a wall and the driver was arrested and nobody knows what happened to him. But uh, MacDonald and uh, his uh, other uh, commander got through and they trained him. And uh, however long it takes to become a tank uh, t proficient in tanks, uh, well, in this case, took two weeks because that's all they had. And they were instrumental in uh, breaking through into the Sheba uh, police station, which I'm, not, I'm sure... A lot of people don't know, but the British police stations were actually called Tegart Forts, that after the name of after Charles Tegart, who designed them, and they were designed to withstand attacks and all the rest, all the rest of it. Anyway, by that time, by the time they went and uh, attacked the Beersheba police station, they had no more tanks. Well in his division. And they put a six pounder onto a half track and attacked the station with support of infantry, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the Israeli Palmach fellow standing between Mori Agdis and my father got taken out and uh, they had to replace him, uh, which they did. 
and Murray was actually the loader. He loaded the cannon, and my father was the used to sight and fire. And what they had to do, because the, a lot of the information, uh, a lot of the ammunition was extracted from the Altalina, even though it had sunk. And uh, it wasn't really uh, that reliable. So they had to put the shell into the, into, into the gun, close it, fire. If nothing happened within 10 seconds, they had to open it, take it out and throw it overboard so that they could uh, put another one in to, to carry on fighting. So you can imagine the stress and strain of pulling out a, a, a shell that may or may not go off in your hands, in your face, is quite considerable. Um, they, yeah, they fought a lot of battles together. They were instrumental in bombing a, a, a bridge, taking out a bridge in front of the advancing um, uh, Lebanese army, um, not Lebanese army, the Jordanian army, because they were mounting a counterattack to capture Beersheba. And they were instrumental in getting a demolition squad to this bridge, taking it out and successfully halting the Jordanian advance on Beersheba. Uh, Part of that, I can't really tell you that much. I mean, I've got a hundred stories that I could tell, but I'm sure time doesn't allow that. Uh, his brother, who uh, David was also in the Palmach, uh, was originally sent to Cyprus into an internment camp because they uh, picked up that he was coming to Israel to fight. Uh, eventually, made it to Israel and also fought. Um, and so the family legacy goes on. What I did do a number of years ago, together with my brother Stephen and our family, is we got my dad to write a book. And that's how we have passed it down to our kids and grandkids. Yeah, beautiful. So I, I, do, I do want to say that someone asked the question, the book 800, which details the story of the Machalniks and the South African Machalniks. Jonathan Ector says he's got a disc that he can digitally print from. So if you don't know where to get hold of him and you do want a copy of the book, just send the Jewish report a mail and we'll pass all the details on to Jonathan yeah. Ectus. Our, there is a copy of the, of the book on the Machal website, a full digital copy. Fantastic. So people can go download it. Yes. Great. Now, other, other than the story of the start of how is North Korea, um, share, <laughs> share some... some Parting words and 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 what a discussion like this, what it evokes in you, you know, with regard to your dad. Oh, well, well, that you know the two things. Um, one is, I I, I I've sat here listening to all of this. It's you know, it's remarkable. People who are heroes who refuse to be thought of as heroes. It's there's a lesson in there somewhere for all of us. Um, but the thing, I, I, I went back to thinking about my father's funeral, and, and I, did, I did it for this reason. During the course of the funeral, the, the, the South African Jewish Ex-Service League, which was substantially Machalniks, used to gather around the graves of their fallen comrades. Um, and they, they, they had a sort of a beautiful ceremony. They, and, and Tuxi, I remember well, uh, your dad being at the being there at the time and they rec it, it recited something and, and it was it ended up by with and you know until the coming of the dawn and the dusk and so on and so forth we will never forget we will always remember and these were ordinary people doing extraordinary things i think at a minimum we owe it to them to create and persevere in this enduring memory um, and it, it's not because they were specifically, you know, e exemplary in any way. They never viewed themselves as exemplary. I think we need to we need to remember that ordinary people, particularly ordinary Jews, can do the most extraordinary things when properly motivated and they put their mind to things. And that, for me, is the great lesson of all of this. I think these were remarkable men and women. And we owe it to their memory to 
create something enduring from, from this and spread these lessons. Amen. Amen. Rodney, I'm going to, I'm going to pass the, the baton to, to you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Just a comment about one of the previous speakers. Uh, uh, I know one of the things my father said when flying to Sodom, when, when Besheva was taken, it made flying to Sodom so much easier. So, you know, these things were also interrelated, uh, what was happening on the ground. Um, uh, just the last few words. Uh, my father actually did a wonderful, he also was one of those that never spoke that much about his, 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 his experiences. But in his latter years, he wrote a memoir. He, he, he directed it toward his grandchildren. It's just a, a, a wonderful mem uh, memory and a legacy that he's left for all of us. Uh, and uh, so much more that we, uh, things that we never knew uh, a while he, uh, uh, previously. Um, thankfully, um, I'm proudly one of his grandchildren is actually living in Israel today, who's made Aliyah, um, my, my nephew Josh. Uh, but just to finish off uh, uh, and, uh, about my father, uh, I think what was really one of the most Poignant things about him actually happened posthumously at his unveiling, um, uh, um, and says so much for 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 this generation of soldiers that 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 fought on our behalf. Uh, someone arrived at the at, at the unveiling, an old army friend. He hadn't seen my father for sixty years, and he had seen the notice in the newspaper. We never knew him. My father never mentioned his name. He came up to us and he just said, I've come to say goodbye to an old army friend. And I, you know, for me, that's just been a wonderful epitaph for him, for him and his life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joey? Yeah, so I think she asked the question about how do we pass this on? And I think the one thing my dad did very well was he tried not to influence us with his own beliefs. He tried to help us make our own decisions, educated decisions. And thank God he turned us all into Zionists. A lot of his grandchildren have landed up in Israel and are doing and have done what they had to do. But his message always to us, and that's the message I think we can all pass on to our kids, is he said, don't ever, ever be embarrassed to fight for our right to exist. We've got every right to exist and we'll do whatever it takes to make sure we continue to exist. And that was his legacy and that was his message that he left to us and to his grandchildren. Amazing. Jason, maybe to hand over to you. I see Sharita's just come on, I think, so I'm not sure if she wants to um, say something as we move to the end of the webinar, but Jason, maybe on behalf of the directors and the, and the, and the producers, and you've heard some amazing stories from, from the, the children of these amazing Mahalniks. Maybe you want to very, say a few words. Very briefly, it was, it was firstly... Thanks again to the, 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 the passion of the South African Jewish community in stepping up to tell a story that is in a way uniquely South African, I think. Um, overwhelmingly, you know, the, the, the numbers were so dis disproportionate for, for the, of, of the South Africans in the overall story. So that is a remarkable story. Again, like Ralph said, you know, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And uh, the blessing to us was that people came together and said, we trust you in making this film. They funded it. And I think we've created something <clears throat> indelible that uh, you know stands to to do to pay homage to the to the people who did become heroes and played their part in a, in a remarkable piece of history that's so significant to the Jewish people. And uh, so, yeah, thanks to everybody, and thanks to Sharit and Etienne, of course, and thanks to the Jewish Report, of course. Thank you, Howie. Before before we hand over you to 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 close out, I want to just say, as we've said so many times on the webinars around the history of of our people and the amazing things through the triumphs and, and the traumas and the, and the happiness and, and the sadness and to, to our panelists on behalf of, of your fathers and to the, the, the many second generation Mahalniks um, who, who have been watching that may your, maybe the memories of your parents be a, a blessing to all of us. Um, maybe their memory be honored. Maybe their story be continued from from generation to generation, and as you've all said, and quoted by Ben Gurion, this war was not won by heroes, the war was won by ordinary men and women 
rising above themselves. Amen. Amen. So, so Hirsch, I think we've heard the story tonight. Uh, Ralph said the words, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I think every single week when we do one of these webinars, one of the 154 web webinars we've done, we really highlight the extraordinary, the unique, and the passion of our community and our people. And I, I think that's one of the great privileges that we have as the Jewish Report to be able to do that. I want to give everyone an opportunity to be a hero as well, because we're using the opportunity as the first online Jewish film festival we think in the world. We're giving people an opportunity to make sure that during this winter, which is cold and dark out there, that people less fortunate than ourselves have some light and some heat. And so we're asking you, if you can afford it, please give a donation to the Angel Network. We're using that money to, in fact, go and take hot water bottles into the townships, to take rechargeable lights into the townships to allow people the opportunity to actually have some warmth and some heat. And we're doing it not just in the townships, we're doing it in our own community as well, because there are many people even within our own community who don't have light and don't have warmth. Last week, we connected enough money to ensure that 500 people got heat, got warmth and got light during this enormously difficult time. We want to make sure that you have the opportunity, if you can afford it, to give some money as a contribution tonight to the people of South Africa, to the Jewish community of South Africa, to make sure that no one should sit in cold and darkness this winter. So we have the snap scan on the screen. Take your phone, point it towards the snap scan. That will open up a little app, or you can do a direct uh, contribution into the Angel Network. Don't forget that all of your contributions are tax deductible, which means you'll get a Section 18A certificate to make sure you can deduct your donation of your taxable income for the year. That's really, really important, I think, to many people. But for those people watching on Zoom again, we're going to do one last poll. If you haven't made a contribution and you'd like us just to send you a mail with all of the information about contributing, please, if you're on Zoom, just click on the poll right now and we'll make sure that tomorrow we send you an email and you can make a donation to make sure we give rechargeable lights for those of you out of south africa ralph you must think we're absolutely insane but we're living in semi-darkness in south africa and it's a cold winter and we want to make sure that our community and everyone who watches us gets the opportunity to make the lives of people just a little bit better around them so thank you so much to everyone who's joined us this evening. We'll be back next week with another festival, uh, another movie in our online Jewish festival. And I think we've got some fantastic movies in store. But really, Hirsch tonight, tonight was once again remarkably inspiring. And it's so nice to see a documentary about the South African Jewish community and the remarkable contribution that we've made throughout the world. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll see you all again soon. Thank you to all of our guests and thank you for those people like Ralph and Dave who jumped on at the last mo moment. We so, so appreciate the fact that you've joined our community and can share these remarkable stories. Good night to all of you. Thank you so much. Amazing.